Welcome everyone to tonight, Wednesday, December 14th, uh, City Council meeting. We will first need to come out of non-public and I would wait a motion to leave the non-public session to seal the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then uh, we will start the meeting with a, uh, a roll call for this meeting. It is a little tricky. This meeting roll call. Certainly. <laughs> Mayor McEachern? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Will be joining us a little later. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley? Here. Council Lombardi? Here. Council Blaylaw? Here. Council Cook? Here. Thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, before uh, we go to the Pledge of Allegiance, um, I would just like to uh, ask uh, for prayers actually for my brother. Um, he had a um, uh, procedure today and um, ended up, uh, it was a normal procedure, um, but had a, uh, a heart attack uh, as a result of that. Duncan was a, or is uh, um, a son of Portsmouth. He was uh, a, um, a vice principal at the middle school a little bit after I started. Um, he will be in a, uh, uh, an induced coma uh, until Friday. Um, his uh, wife, Sylvie, uh, who also he met when he was a teacher at the middle school, so over in Paris, uh, his daughter uh, is back from, from uh, first year. Um, went to Paris, is back in Paris, and uh, her uh, brother, his son, uh, Lucas, is finishing up exams. Uh, we're hopeful for uh, a speedy recovery, um, but uh, still uh, not out of the woods yet. So um, uh, think of him uh, and, and all of your loved ones. Uh, it's a, it, it, it can be uh, pretty quick um, for things to, to change unexpectedly. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now, the happiest time. Oh, Russ is just going to go into it. So no introduction whatsoever, but um, PMAX um, Brewery Big Band Holiday Music Performance. We're so happy to have you in here. Please fill the hall with beautiful sounds of the holiday season.
I don't know if I'm able to say something really quick, but first, thank you so much for having us here today. The Brewery Lane Big Band is part of PMAC's extensive adult ensemble program, community members coming together to play music together every single week. It's something that we're very passionate about at PMAC, and we currently have 14 different adult ensembles meeting every single week at our school, everything from jazz big band to concert band to string ensembles to bluegrass to rock, all different types of things. And I did want to mention very proudly here in the community today that the Foundation for Seacoast Health just awarded PMAC with a grant that's going to make all of these ensembles now free for anyone 75 or older. So now older adults in the community will not have to make choices about whether or not they want to participate in these programs. This is going to keep people engaged in their community and active well into their 80s and 90s. So we're really proud of that. So thank you for having us here today. We're going to finish with Let It Snow, which we hope it doesn't do on Friday, but uh, <laughs> you can blame us if it does happen. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Russ, uh, and thank you, Katie, uh, and all of PMAC, and for the Brewery Big Band uh, Orchestra here. And, and we'll take a, a five-minute recess, but before we do, uh, I had the pleasure of, of uh, joining PMAC's 20th anniversary celebration, and I want to just note that you guys have been uh, making music in the community for uh, this long, and really making community uh, happen in our community. So. Thank you so much uh, for that. And there's a quote that I, um, I remind myself often of uh, in, uh, in, on this side of the dais, but let me write the songs of a nation and I care not who writes the laws. Uh, thank you for being uh, the soundtrack tonight for Portsmouth. Uh, we're better for it. Uh, and thank you so very much. Another round of applause. <laughs> right. 
take a five minute recess as we get these chairs out and we'll resume after that. Thanks. <laughs>
All right, welcome back, and thanks again uh, to PMAC and the Brewery Big Band. Uh, that was awesome. So next up, uh, we have the acceptance of minutes, which there are none, um, or recognitions and volunteer committee reports. So we're on to public comment uh, with the first uh, speaker, uh, Paige Trace, for the topic of Portsmouth. everyone it's Christmas um, page trace 27 Hancock Street I could talk to you tonight about a lot of things but you've been here a year and you're all still here and you're all succeeding very well so maybe it's better that I just simply say Merry Christmas Happy New Year to you all and a healthy new year um, and maybe you'll say a little something for those bugs out on Pierce Island, because I'm thinking they're a little cold. Anyway, thank you all and Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Paige, Merry Christmas. And yes, we will need those bugs on Friday when we're getting two inches of rain. <laughs> Next up, Esther Kennedy uh, with the topic of water. I think water. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Merry Kwanzaa. I am uh, here to talk about water, but I do want to put a, a little question and plug in for our downtown non-dining businesses. I know you're talking about dining in the streets tonight a little bit, and doing an overview. And I happened to go into two businesses to do Christmas shopping on Saturday. And in one case, I was running in just to um, pick up some shoes that I had ordered. And the business person, it was nice just to park quickly, run in. It was Saturday in the middle of the day. There was parking. And the business owner said, isn't it nice to have parking again? In another case, I was going into another business, and the person knew me and said, Esther, this needs to stop. We need to have our parking. So I hope that we don't just think about the restaurants. I know it's an important entity in our community, and it's a very celebratory entity in our community, but I hope we think about those poor businesses and the parking that we take away, that they don't have the quick run in, I got 10 minutes to pick something up, or I got a few minutes to run in and get the thing I saw a couple weeks ago. So I just hope as you have your discussion, you include that. Um, I also want to point out on what I really was here to talk about is the CIP. I know we're having a meeting tomorrow night. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend. However, I really want you to think about water, folks. There's a lot of money in that CIP, millions in that CIP for sewage treatment plants. One is out at Pease, and there is a lot of money, and I hope you do your research. Because the one on Pierce Island, um, there is a need to add more to that plant. Exactly what we said was going to be a problem has now ended up being a problem by our experts that we hired when we questioned it in the first place. And I really, really hope you all do your research so that we can have a good discussion when we're talking about those sewer treatment plants and the water line, the drinking water. Lastly, um, the intimate domain of the drinking water, I'm hoping you're questioning it. Intimate domain is very hard as a counselor to think about and want to do. And I really hope that we can look for other alternatives and work with the members that might be involved, the citizens that might be involved, whether they're our citizens or another community citizens. But there's usually a way around it. And uh, over my time on the council, we were able to find numerous ways around without having to do intimate domain and taking a property. So thank you, and again, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy Kanza. Thank you, Esther. Uh, and, and next up, we have, is Artie here? No, Arthur Clough. I'm sure he'll be back, Your Honor. All right. Um, next up. Your Honor, he comes. He's coming. Look at that. Arthur, right on time. With the topic of background checks.
Merry Christmas, and thank you for the nicest welcome ever. I'm Arthur Clough, 431 Pleasant Street. Uh, in the course of hiring people, background checks are done. Um, I work in the financial industry. When I have a background check done, they check my credit to see if it's good, if I have any bankruptcies, if I have um, been honest about my educational background, if I've been honest about my past employment background, the reasons why I left my jobs, the whole thing. For other uh, jobs, it's less. If you work at a retail store, you probably just get a criminal background check. Um, that's the basis of almost every background check. And if you're a police officer or in finance, um, then you get a financial background check. And I've known of people uh, who went through the entire course of interviews and had impeccable educational background, and they, at the very end, did the credit check. They didn't get hired specifically for not having good enough credit. The reason is, if you're in finance and you're going to be close to the money, we need to know that you're healthy in your finances. And bankruptcy is a pretty grave place to get to uh, for a person, especially somebody who's going to be working with money. This is uh, something that shouldn't be missed. There was a police officer here once during the course of his employment. He, got, he went through a personal bankruptcy. It was the same officer that was involved in the Goodwin-Weber case, one of the officers involved. And he also, when he left, he got an illegal, unapproved, not officially approved, $60,000 plus payout. That's the kind of thing you have to watch out for for people who can't manage their finances. So for the last 27 years that we've had the same auditor, we've had somebody pretty high up in the finance department with a personal bankruptcy. This is the red flag that you look for to make sure that the people that you have working for you are going to be careful with your money. It is disturbing, and I believe at this point, even if we change our auditor, because we haven't been very thorough about our background checks, it appears that we probably need to have a forensic audit. And even worse, uh, the auditor that people fought so hard to keep ended up giving data that produced a CAFA report that still won an award, but was missing crucial data as pointed out and requested by former counsel of Petra Huda, who has not received the figures as of the last time I spoke with her. So background checks, yeah, they matter. Thank you, Arthur. Next up, Sue Poadora on the subject of, I think, appointments uh, and other. Sue Polidora, Middle Street. Um, I read an article in the paper today regarding the appointment of Mr. Reum to the Sony Board, the CBA. And I was just on the hall, the, the HDC meeting. And before they even start the meeting, they have a statement saying that their goal is to avoid any kind of conflict of interest. So they read this statement just before they start. And I'm thinking this appointment should have raised the flag to many people on the council, and it didn't. Now, I am not questioning the background of the people involved. I hear that very outstanding people. Mr. Riom is very outstanding. His wife is very outstanding. But the goal here is to avoid any kind of perception of impropriety at all levels, it should be the goal of every committee in the city, it should be your goal. Um, it, is, it is surprising to me that nobody in this council voted against that appointment, knowing that it might lead to some sort of conflict in the future. Um, I cannot understand why. Like I said, the people are, have excellent reputation but the fact that they, are, they have a close relationship with each other and they're in two quasi-conflicting uh, 
a political boards, you might want to say, creates a, a perception that you do not want. And I am amazed that everybody here proved it and nobody saw it. So I'm going to recommend that during the holidays you would think about this, because it is your job to portray the affairs of the city at a level where nobody can cast a shadow on anybody, on the proceedings, on the outcomes, or anything. So I leave that with you. Just wanted to bring uh, my opinion regarding this. Again, I have been part of many situations where if I have certain uh, that I needed to walk a very straight line when it came to taking any kind of um, perception or leaning towards one supplier or another. So this is something that I'm very familiar with. And I would like your, your consideration and resolve this issue because it will come back and will be uh, a detriment to the city of Portsmouth. Also, very quickly, we need updates on McIntyre. Uh, the, this, this is a big mess, just kind of getting more and more uh, convoluted and messier. We need to have the details Thank as you, soon sir. as possible. Thank you. Happy holidays. Next up is Duncan here. His topic is scheduling city council meeting on the same night and the same time as an important HDC meeting. So I could take that as he's not here. Okay, well, if he gets done with that important meeting, I uh, can come back to this one um, and we'll hold it open if we don't have any speakers. Uh, next up is uh, Francis Cormier on the topic of being nice or be nice. Francis Cormier, Melbourne Street, uh, title, be nice. Very few people know this, but the last dairy farm in the city of Portsmouth was owned and operated by a woman. Her name was Mrs. Stokel. Her love for dairy farming kept things going into the 1960s. One day, she invited us kids into the barn to pet the cows. She also had a gigantic bull. His name was Pat. He was nice, but big and scary. She told us kids the reason dairy farmers keep a bull is because they help the cows make their babies. One day she went to lead Pat out into the barnyard when all of a sudden he turned on her and with his gigantic forehead he pinned her against the wall and Mrs. Stokel began to suffocate. That's not nice, is it? So she reached out and grabbed the brass ring that was in Pat's nose and pulled real hard. This gave the bull a brain and he learned to be nice real fast. In a similar way, the history of our nation is marked with men and women fighting with one another. So in due time, God sent a man to help us. His name was Martin Luther King Jr. He began teaching us how to be nice to each other and forgive those that hurt us. But one day a bad man came and shot him. Everyone was sad, but soon our sadness turned to anger and we began fighting with each other all over again. That's not nice, is it? To put things in the words of folk singer Joan Baez, who wrote in one of her songs, it takes more than guns to kill a man. I never died, said he. I never died, said he, end quote. Martin, I know you're up there and you're safe now in the presence of Jesus, but let it be known that the mission God gave you, one of nonviolence, peace, and love, was not in vain. As we enter the year 2023 and celebrate the birthday of Martin Luther King. Let us always remember, be nice to each other. Thank you, Francis. Next up, nice message for the holidays. Um, be nice to one another. Um, we have Nancy uh, Kleberg um, on Zoom. Hello, everyone. 
Hi, Nancy. Nancy. Wish everyone happy holidays. Can you hear me? We can. Loud and clear. Oh, okay. Good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. Um, I am Nancy Clayberg. I'm at 405 FW Hartford Drive. And many of you know that I have the distinct honor of being the chairman of the um, Horseman School Board. And I just wanted to take a minute to applaud our police department and our school department. Many of you know that last Thursday we had a, um, a hoax, a, a shooter called the um, potential shooter called the police department to say that there was, um, we had a shooter in our high school, which fortunately turned out to be false. But what was so impressive, and I think the citizens of Portsmouth should be very proud of the response that our police department had with our school department. Within two minutes, our police chief Newport was in the office of our superintendent, Dr. McLaughlin, and they were working out the strategy that would take place over the next several hours. Um, many of you may know that the agreement was made to lock down all the schools. Um, the police were immediately dispatched to each school um, with the New Hampshire state authorities, and the schools were all swept, and it was determined that there was no danger to any There was no active shooter in any of the buildings. So um, the announcement was made that um, the school would be um, put back in operation. Um, but what I think is really impressive and what really needs to be told is the cooperation between our police and our schools. I know that doesn't happen in every community, and I think it's something that we should be very proud of. Um, the response was immediate. The response was strategic. The response was made with intelligent input. And um, also, I will add that parents were notified as soon as um, the police chief and our superintendent felt that they had the um, opportunity to inform and parents to inform parents as to what was going on. So um, obviously, nothing's perfect. Um, I know that um, Chief Police Chief Newport and Dr. Zach, uh, Dr. Um, McLaughlin are going back over the steps of what happened last Thursday and making any improvements or adjustments that they feel are necessary. Um, we also are looking at. Do we need added personnel in our schools to deal with situations like this that might happen in the future? Um, we do have a full-time middle school resource officer and we do have a full-time high school resource officer. So the question is, um, do we need some kind of personnel at our elementary school, whether it be resource officer, added mental health professionals, added social workers to help students at the elementary level when an event like this happens? So. I want the public to be assured that um, the police and the schools are working together to come up with a strategy to address that issue also. So I just want to take an opportunity to thank um, the cooperation and the collaboration that we have in this community. I think it's something that we should all be very proud of. Um, and hopefully an incident like this will never happen again. I think you may know that the same phone call was received at several other high schools in New Hampshire. Um, it was a hoax. Apparently, it's untraceable, so it's not anything that we can ever find out what really happened. But um, I just wanted to, to, to let everybody know that I'm, I'm very proud of how our community responded to this and, um, and hope that you all, you all have a wonderful, wonderful holiday season. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Thank you, Chairman Kleberg. Uh, appreciate that, uh, that update <clears throat> and would agree. Uh, with the, the swiftness and the response of both the police and school departments on that day as a dad to a, a six-year-old in the first year of kindergarten. Um, I think that's it. Um, we'll, we'll have to let uh, Duncan's topic uh, uh, deliver his, uh, I'm sure, uh, it would have expounded on that we shouldn't schedule city council meetings in the same night as HDC meetings, uh, <clears throat> but we did so. Uh, recognizing uh, the Hanukkah um, overlap on Monday night and as a council we've, we've looked to avoid. Uh, so um, unfortunately we will have to wait to hear what he has to say until the next uh, the next city council meeting. So with that uh, we will go to uh, third and final reading of ordinance amending chapter 12 and chapter 15 
City's Building Code uh, at wait a motion to pass third and final reading of the ordinances presented. So moved, Your Honor. Second. Any discussion and or questions for this? Seeing none, uh, thank you for the effort that went into producing this. Uh, we'll have a, uh, a roll call vote. Okay. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Jenton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylaw? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous? Next up, third and final reading of ordinance amending Chapter 5, Article 1, Fire Department, Section 5.101, Personnel, and Article 9, Fire Code. I'd wait a motion to move uh, to third and uh, let's see, to uh, move to pass uh, th uh, third reading of ordinance as presented. So moved. moved. Second. Uh, I'll have a, any discussion of a roll call on this. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley? Yes. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McEachern? Yes. Unanimous. Next up, our city manager. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> we have four items for you this evening. The first one <coughs> is uh, a renewal concession agreement between the city and Operation Blessing, Inc for use of the Greenleaf Recreation Center. And the renewal agreement is uh, in your packet and proposed. We, uh, we've had the pleasure of working with uh, Operation Blessing since 2000, I'm sorry, 2014. And prior to that, and since we've acquired the building from the federal government, uh, before Operation Blessing, it was the Portsmouth Housing Authority. And those organizations have a close relationship. You may recall that the property was former U U.S. Coast Guard maintenance facility, which was then deeded over to the city as surplus property. And the agreement is um, to support Operation Blessing's running of and programming of uh, serving persons with disabilities, uh, providing youth recreation and out-of-school programs and adult programming, including the use of the facilities for residential groups. And as many folks know, it's in very close proximity to Wamaset, which is very helpful to that neighborhood. And the use of the center will continue as in prior years. We're looking to extend the term of this agreement from two years to five to make it consistent with other city leases and licenses. And we've reduced the limits of liability to be consistent as well. Operation Blessing in turn will update its list of programming and provide the city with annual participation reports as well as a copy of its strategic plan. And the city enjoys working with Operation Blessing and when we would look to have the city council move to accept the, this renewal extension. We a motion to accept the renewal extension of the Greenleaf Recreations Concession Agreement with Operation Blessing Incorporated as presented. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Um, I'm just curious as to, since I happen to spend a lot of time near this property, you can even see the corner of my office building in the picture. Um, the land that's all behind the recreation building, is there a possibility of us turning that into like a sort of little like I don't know, thinking like a swing set and something, something for the kids that actually hang out in that neighborhood. It seems like it's just a large grassy area that's sort of overgrown and not maintained. So I was just thinking, is there another use that we could possibly do to that? We could certainly look into it. I know there's concern about liability um, outside of ours and, and what the um, original uh, procurement agreement with the federal government allows. So we could certainly look into that and report back. That would be great because I know that there's a lot of kids that just sit in the parking lot of our office condo instead. So it would be nice to give them a safer place than sitting in the middle of a parking lot. <laughs> Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Great. The second request is to schedule a public hearing for a supplemental appropriation related to the McIntyre project. And as shared in the packet, um, and as shared at the previous uh, city council meeting held on December 5th, we received preliminary cost estimates. They vary very widely. And as such, in order to achieve um, uh, a pri uh, the 
to co accommodate the financial plan that accompanies a National Park Service submission. We asked for and received a 90-day extension from the National Park Service and the General Services Administration. And during the next three months, we will engage in discussions related to how to advance uh, all of these elements of the application. The expected expenses are estimated to be up to $50,000 per party per month. So it is our request at the January 9th meeting that, this, that the City Council uh, provide uh, approval for a supplemental appropriation in an amount not to exceed $150,000. I'd wait a motion to schedule a public hearing at the January 9th, 2023 City Council meeting regarding the proposed supplemental appropriation. So moved, Your Honor. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I just uh, want to say I'm looking forward to hearing the public's comments on that night. I think you speak for us all uh, on that. Look forward to hearing the public uh, comment and the plan uh, presented. Uh, and without uh, any other comment or question, and this is to simply hold the public hearing, just to clarify. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Thank you. Item number three is a temporary construction license for 46 State, State Street. It is known on the city's assessor map as tax map 0105, lot 0011. The applicant is performing exterior brickwork improvements to this property, and the applicant has encumbered the sidewalk and can do so administratively through our staff for up to 30 working days. That permit will expire on December 15th. The applicant is looking to extend uh, the encumbrance beyond 30 days, and as such, they're requesting this license agreement. So the applicant seeks to encumber three parking spaces along with the sidewalk in, so in front of the subject property between the dates of December 16th and February 28th. The sidewalk will be encumbered in two phases. For the first 30 days, it will be completely uh, inaccessible, and for the remaining 45 days, there will be passed through staging. And as you recall, we look to charge for um, inaccessible areas, but we typically waive the fee when there is passed through staging. So as a combination of the license fee for the three parking spaces plus the uh, encumbrance of the sidewalk for the first 30 days, the total uh, license fee would be $11,670. And both legal and planning have looked at the request and have approved it to form. I'd wait a motion. Uh to authorize the city manager to execute and accept the temporary construction license construction license to con encumber the sidewalk and three parking spaces that abut 46 State Street as requested. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Cook. Um, I just have a question for the city manager. Um, this, uh, this project <coughs> blocks, I think, one of the primary paths to downtown for um, individuals living in the neighborhoods beyond it. Um, I think not a lot of people think about crossing the street there and then crossing back again um, to avoid this project. Uh, how will we make sure that this alternative path is clearly marked? And also, what can we do to make sure that that path is also cleared quickly for, of ice and snow during the winter? Right. Well, let me address the, the second question first. Uh, we will strictly enforce the clearing of the sidewalk by the applicant and we will work with the applicant to properly sign the need to cross because they'll not only run into the inaccessible parking uh, the sidewalk, but they'll run into the encumbered parking space as well. So we will make sure it's signed. Any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. The last request is to schedule a work session following up on an earlier request by the council at one of the October meetings to schedule a work session on the disposition uh, of the Sherburn School. And what we're proposing is that we tack it on to an existing uh, previously approved work session for the to go over the audit on January 12th. So uh, in a perfect world, the audit conversation is 6 to 7, and then we would speak to the disposition of Sherburn School from 7 to 8. I'd wait a motion to schedule a work session regarding the disposition of the Sherburn School on January 12th, 2023 at 7 p.m. So, so moved. moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? Your Honor, um, in preparation for that, I'd just request um, if the staff could show us 
uh, any and all places that potential projects with Portsmouth Housing Authority might be placed on the site. Housing being, I think, a goal of this council. Question for the city manager, do we have that uh, identified already? We can make sure that it is part of the presentation. And it would, um, would we have, uh, it would be, I guess my expectation that um, the PHA would be a part of that conversation. I think it would make the most sense for them to be part of, uh, present their preliminary thoughts that great. relate to the site. That'd be great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll go uh, Councilor Lombardi, then Councilor Cook. Uh, just a question. Uh, so has the school department released this property? The school, the school board took a vote in July to uh, relocate the Lister Academy to the community campus, and when that, but without a date certain, and when that were, was to take place, that they would no longer require the use of the Sherburn School for educational uses. Okay. So, quick follow up to that: we cannot, the, if a, the city only controls the uh, the property, I guess, in in concept only, if a school uh, facility is occupying that and they have to actively decide to leave that uh, and alert us. So that is what would have to happen for us to, to gain actual control um, of, the, of the property, even though it is okay. our property. I, I thought there was more. There yeah. is, so they have to, they have to um, basically the community campus has to meet the needs before they can, uh, before they can move, and there's, that needs to happen. Thank you. Councilor Cook. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, will we include representatives of uh, the the schools um, at this meeting so that we can ask questions of them? Or we could certainly do that. Um, so I think um, here would be, if I could tackle that. I think the um, we have. I think we know where the school stands in the standpoint of they have they have made a vote to leave provided that they can move to the uh, uh, the um, community campus. Um, we have some work to do on the community campus to get them to be able to, to, to get them in there. So I think it would certainly can invite them, but um, I would expect it to be more in a asking questions, but considering they're currently there, it might be a good idea to make sure that they are involved but I would I would hope that the conversation is centered around what we can do provided that we can accommodate them in the community campus um, that would be the hopefully the goal but good call I think they'd want to be a part of it Councilor Denton thank you your honor would it be possible to hold the work session at Sherburn school mm. oh I don't know if we have the technological I'm hookups. thinking about whether it's accessible or not we definitely do not have the technological capacity and I'm unsure of how accessible the building is okay. we could certainly provide um, so an inventory a pictorial inventory would it make sense for folks to you know have a slide deck of what the building looks like well I think also maybe to Councilor Denton's point it might be nice because the neighbors could come very easily uh, right. From there, uh, it, predominantly Panaway could make it into to that. So that would be nice. I mean, I think you don't think Kevin can whip up a, a teleconferencing. <laughs> so he turned the <laughs> he turned the TV on so quickly. After, after he could produce it, it, but he could not um, broadcast it live. Is what I believe is the correct answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm getting yeah. a thumbs up on that. Um, that doesn't mean we couldn't. Um, share it as soon as it's over that's what typically happens thank you maybe we could proceed the meeting with a 30-minute site visit we'd have to do it before the audit um, presentation from six to seven we could reorder things we could do uh, all sorts of maybe things. a 530 site visit followed by the meeting or something Happy to entertain whatever it might take a little longer to, to accommodate a six o'clock start 
whatever the will of the council would be. Hmm. I would also suggest it'll be the first of many conversations about the Sherburn School. Maybe we follow up with a specific meeting that involves touring the entire property. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. That may be the best way to do it. A follow on visit. All right, so I, I think the motion that we have uh, to schedule a work session regarding the disposition of the server and school on January 12th, 2023 uh, uh, at 7 p.m. encompasses the conversation to, to date. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. All right, next up is the consent agenda. And uh, I wait a motion to adopt uh, the consent agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. We have presentation of uh, our uh, planning director, Beverly Mesa Zent, um, as you're coming up. Um, I would like to to thank you for the work that you've provided the the city of Portsmouth. Um, your professionalism and execution has been uh, noticed by so many in our community, and and you've left a mark. Even if it was a, a short time, we wish you all the best uh, in your new endeavors and whatever the new year brings. But personally, thank you for drinking from a fire hose for um, and and never uh, ever uh, uh, flinching and always having. All of these archaic things that I struggled to even read properly, seemingly from memory. Um, so appreciate all of the work that you've you've given uh, for the city of Portsmouth, and look forward to uh, this well-crafted end of season report. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So, um, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, at the February 22nd, 2022 meeting, uh, City Council was directed to provide an end of the year report. Council asked that staff survey restaurants to better understand the customer demand for outdoor spaces, survey local businesses within 100 feet of outdoor cafes to better understand impacts uh, to and concerns of abutting businesses, and maintain a database that sort of identifies concerns and conflicts related to outdoor dining. So this is the end of the year report with will it include some staff recommendations. Tonight I'll cover a little background, uh, talk about the season in review, what we saw this year in terms of participation, uh, survey responses from abutters and also from participating a bit, um, uh, cafes and drinking and eating establishments, and then staff recommendations for the year coming. Um, As part of that February report that staff presented, uh, staff introduced the concept of providing a transitional year. Uh, this year would introduce reduced fees and a slow integration of programmatic requirements that would allow businesses to have, uh, to, who have come to rely on outdoor dining to prepare for and transition to uh, stricter regulations and potentially fees as well. Uh, pro programmatic features for 2022 that were different than 2021 included an interdepartmental working group to administer the program, uh, the adoption of fees, uh, ten, uh, I mean five dollars per square foot for sidewalks and non-parking spaces, and fifteen hundred dollars per parking space. So. We also had a butter approval that was shown on the screen. As, uh, we required that um, abutting businesses also provide approval uh, for the business to extend in front of those abutting businesses. So these were some of the uh, the uh, requirements that we introduced this year. We developed a form, and abutters had to complete that form for the business to extend in front of um, their uh, business. So I'd like to start with a season in review. Um, we received 47 applications, uh, 43 were approved, two withdrawn, and two were never completed. And the two that were withdrawn were redirected to other processes uh, that serve their needs better. Um, 21 uh, street licenses were issued, uh, two were for sidewalk and for streets, um, and 20 were sidewalk only. Of those street licenses, five were in the travelway, 12 were in parking spaces, two were in the travelway ne necessitating conversion of parking for traffic, two were in the loading zone, and one was in the loading zone necessitating conversion of parking for loading. Um, 
uh, we received a total revenue of uh, $98,605. Um, the biggest chunk of that came from sidewalk licenses, which I'm sorry, from parking service agreements, which was $51,900. Uh, I wanted to also note that six outdoor dining recipients applied for and received a $200 credit for composting. They were able to show their compost, composting service agreement, and we gave them that $200 credit. I'd like to talk a little bit about what we heard from a Butters. Uh, from November 1 through November 23rd, the city surveyed abutting businesses and residents. Um, 95, uh, as it turns out, that the, the respondents, out of 139 respondents, 95 were residents, 16 were retail business owners, 16 were office or non-retail business owners, 6 were dining or drinking establishments, and 6 were identified as other. Um, when asked to describe their experience as an outdoor dining and butter, 88 uh, percent, which or 63.8 percent, indicated their experience was positive. 12% indicated their experience was neutral, and 38% indicated their experience was negative. Um, those, that, those who uh, responded that the experience was negative um, identified loss of parking, impact to business, and disrupted traffic, traffic circulation as the main reason for their negative response. We included a quote here saying outdoor dining blocks sidewalks even when it's unused, which is often. It often it offers limited benefits for a few businesses at the expense of other businesses, pedestrian traffic, parking spaces, uh, delivery spaces, and vehicular traffic. Some of the recommendations that uh, were uh, were identified by the abutters were. And there's a whole host of those, and the full report is included in your packet, and the full survey results in your packet as well. Provide standards for barriers, provide more uniformity, um, fewer outdoor dining locations. One suggestion was even a lottery. Move tables near restaurant entrances, away from residential entrances. Consider impacts to traffic and turning visibility. Do not allow, do not allow forced one-way streets. Shorten the season from May to November. Create a pedestrian-only zone in Market Square and impo impose an enforced noise ordinance after 9 p.m. Of the participant surveys, we had seven respondents. On a scale of one to five, respondents rated the importance of outdoor dining 4.7. Similarly, respondents rated the experience as a 4.7, uh, um, in indicating an overall positive experience. So. Uh, when asked to further elaborate on their experience, respondents identified increased revenue, foot traffic, and downtown activity and vibrancy as the main reasons for rating the experience positive. Some of the recommendations, uh, we didn't get actually quite a lot of recommendations, but one was uh, a suggestion not to increase fees. When asked how to increase in fees would affect a decision to participate, the average respondent rating was 3.2 on a scale of 1 to 5. Uh, there's a comment here, I don't think you should increase the fee. Restaurants have a hard enough time with staffing getting items to cover menu needs. One participant also suggested more communication between the city and business community to understand the long-term viability of the program. Some staff recommendations. Uh, tonight, if the council is ready, staff is seeking some guidance about the programmatic requirements going forward. The next few slides will summarize some of our uh, recommendations for the next uh, outdoor dining season. Uh, staff recommends that future outdoor dining be restricted to parking spaces, sidewalks, and loading zones, and uh, only when a parking space, loading zones only when there's a parking space available to off um, set the loss of that loading zone. Similarly, um, applications that result in a significant impact to traffic pattern or that result in a change to directional pattern street should not be considered. And in arriving at that recommendation, we really did receive impact from, I mean, comment not only from the public on this issue, but also from multiple staff members who were charged with the enforcement and management of traffic that was redirected. So it does reflect both the public and staff concerns. Some of the comments that we received from staff were restricting traffic or creating a one-way street on established two-way street was problematic in 2022. Drivers accustomed to two-way traffic often did not notice or chose to ignore the do not enter sign. So traveling the wrong way up what was now designated as a one-way street. The closing of streets or lanes that signalize in intersections required changes to signal operations, which often resulted in inefficiencies in traffic and pedestrian flow. Additionally, solid waste pickup locations on newly created one-way streets resulted in cars stacking behind solid waste trucks, generating complaints from drivers, residents, and business owners. Stack, staff looked at traffic counts for early December, 
um, this year and found uh, Fleet Street, and this was a request uh, from one of the council members at the last meeting, so we're responding to that. I believe it was uh, Council Member Tabor. Um, uh, Fleet Street at Gillies, um, we, uh, there was a uh, 2,370 vehicles per workday counted. I think this was over a period of a few days that these, uh, these counts were taken. And 2,254 on a Saturday. Pleasant Street at the Clipper Tavern, 2,550 on a weekday. 2,422 on Saturday. Hill Street at Tanner Street, 50 workday. We did not get a Saturday count there. Staff would project a 10% increase to those numbers um, for the summer season. Continuing. Um, staff recommends a fee of $3,000. Um, you may recall this was our, re our recommendation last year, but as part of the transition, council chose to um, cut that fee to $1,500. Um, and this would include loading zones where on-street parking has been used to replace um, the loading zone that is repurposed for outdoor dining. Um, the annual revenue you may recall in our original presentation is approximately 5,700 weighted for the partial year. We have that information from our uh, director of parking and this was based on 2,021 revenues. A total of 67 parking spaces altogether were out repurposed for outdoor dining. Uh, the approximate normal season revenue generated from those total spaces is $384,278. Uh, the fees for parking space, again, were approved at $1,500, and staff is recommending that uh, we return to the $3,000 uh, uh, recommendation. This, of course, does not create full cost recovery on those loss um, of spaces. Um, we recognize that there is continued value that's brought by the conversion of those spaces to the vibrancy and overall traffic in the community. Uh, and by that, I mean business traffic. Um, um, but uh, we, um, we would like to recommend that even, and also for loading zones that are uh, lost for the parking spaces that are used to repurpose those. Um, staff recommends on the next slide. Um, this is actually an error. We recommended $10 last year, but we are, uh, and uh, council again approved a $5. I believe that I actually reached out, but I'm not certain I got the answer on this one, but I think that's based on sidewalk encumbrance fees that we use that $10 a square foot. Um, so uh, staff is recommending that the sidewalk fees um, move to $10 um, in, a, in accordance with that original recommendation. And then last of all, the question of barriers. We did get quite a few comments that many of you may notice in the survey regarding sort of the um, inconsistency in the barriers. Some were really, um, you know, uh, looked very sharp. Some were very tall. We did have a, a deal, a great deal of um, enforcement questions about that. I think the intent of the barriers was really to create sort of an outdoor community. So often if we saw barriers that were taller than people creating almost an extended room where there was a wall, we would ask that they reduce it. But this became challenging when some of the barriers had some transparency and others didn't, and does this meet the standard? And we had to make a lot of calls on that. Um, and so uh, enforcement of barriers uh, and additions to the, um, to the Jersey barriers really were um, an ongoing issue throughout the season. Um, we, option one, um, staff would recommend that uh, barriers be limited to three feet, except for the addition of, which is the Jersey barriers, except for the addition of the planters. And um, the picture there shows really an example of that. You can kind of see the planters over the Jersey barrier, and um, that would be a consistent look for the on-street dining. Uh, no additional barriers or, or uh, separators beyond this would be allowed for on-street dining. Uh, flexibility could still occur for sidewalk dining, um, but this would be a recommendation for the on-street. Just flat out three, the only addition that you can get is an additional four feet for the, um, for the planters. Um, and then I'd like to just photo, give photo credit to Ann Weidman who took some of these photos. Um, option two would be that again, that the barriers, the on-street barriers would be limited to three feet with the planters, but then we could introduce a standardized barrier for the sidewalks as well. So we would recommend that and they would have to purchase like one, of, you know, we would identify a certain uh, standard or quality that we'd like to see and they would have to purchase that for the, or we could you know, potentially rent those, but it seems like it'd make more sense that they would have to purchase whatever we decide is in conformance. And it would be a certain standardized height. I believe that the rec you know, we would want to recommend three to four feet, but certainly continuing that outdoor community sense. And the last um, recommendation, of course, is uh, 
uh, standardized barriers for, um, three to five feet on the street. Um, it would be uh, we could pursue something aside from the um, Jersey barriers. Of course, there's safety issues, and those are put there in place for a reason. But this is what we went with sort of as a short-term fix. I'm not – that would probably incur some uh, – some cost to acquire something different that we would require to be standardized, um, and then a standardized one for sidewalks as well. So, and then of course all barriers. We there's I think the picture on the last one really shows. A, I'm sorry if you could go back one. Really shows one of the barriers that you know we thought. Well, this is actually it's really you know it's on the street. It's very transparent. It seems to not you know violate the idea of creating that open air sort of community feeling. Um, but uh, I think that's probably one of the more expensive barriers that probably was put up. So really just trying to come up with some standardized yet affordable thing would be the challenge. But certainly we had a lot of, a lot of issues raised about that and materials, a consistency of materials. So. Um, you, the, you know, the abutter requirement, we developed a form and we would send them the form and say get your neighbors to sign this. You have two neighbors, you're encroaching into their area. Actually worked really well. We got those back, and it was interesting that even some of the folks who might have complained about their neighbor, somehow there was either negotiation or discussion, and then they would essentially sign the butter the butter notice. Not in every case. In some cases, they would have to sort of move their uh, outdoor dining cafe a little bit uh, closer to their um, their establishment. You might recall that it was essentially the way we looked at it is that if you project the storefront straight out to the midline of the street. Anything that would encroach beyond that would essentially require a butter notification or butter approval. And we did get a good many of those forms back. And um, uh, we would recommend that we continue that program, but we might want to also extend that to the residences uh, that um, you know, I, we did actually capture a few residents uh, in this last round. And but we would definitely want to, um, if it was a residence, we would want to capture the residence approval of that as well. And that gets a little trickier, but we think that there was enough interest in that that we could continue that. And sometimes we would want to see it blocking an entrance to a residential unit or something of that nature. So, um, so that's our recommendation. We have a couple other um, recommendations. Season dates. Um, staff recommends that uh, the season, the application period begins February 24th. Uh, outdoor dining would begin May 1st so that during that period of time we could start to uh, get the barriers in place and begin May 1st. Barrier placement uh, would begin May 1st and then um, November 12th to uh, 2023 the outdoor dining season would end. And uh, this was a recommendation provided by Ann Weidman who really did a lot of work to try and work with our local cafes and drinking and restaurant establishments to really come up with something that made sure that we had ADA um, accessible opportunities for um, our community members with disabilities. Um, and these are some of the recommendations um, put forward. Um, every outdoor dining place should be accessible at least for some portion of the tables. Often that would be just a sign saying if you would like a if you require a special accommodation, just let us know, and then they would go ahead and make that available. And I think that seemed to work um, in a pretty positive way. And the uh, restaurants and establishments were pretty compliant with that. Platforms that are flush with a sidewalk are recommended. We had a good example earlier of how that was shown. And um, platforms with steps probably would not be recommended. Um, portable ramp, though, and many of our businesses worked with Ann to get these rubber ramps in place that were not terribly expensive and really um, provided the necessary accommodation. And then uh, dining areas and parking spaces that have no available curb cut should use rubber threshold mats for curbing up to four, four uh, inches, the curb height most common in Portsmouth. So these are some of the recommendations brought forward by Ann and Barbara Massar, Massar, Executive Director of Pro Portsmouth, also had a recommendation that application, applicants approved for dining and parking spaces on Pleasant Street between State Street and the Square may not begin outdoor dining until after Market Square Day. We might modify that to say that they would take it down for that period of time or um, because that is typically in June, but we uh, understand her concerns related to that. And that is a summary of all the staff recommendations. I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Uh, just quickly on the last one, what ones did we approve on uh, Pleasant Street between uh, State Street and the Square? I think just Stady, right? Uh, it was Stady? Uh, I'm not certain. But I think that was after. I don't think there were. 
You're right. I don't think they moved till after. Yeah. I think it's more in Congress. Yeah. And Between did, State Street and the square. I'm not were sure. They in park, parking spots or just in the. I mean, okay. I don't want to I think she. I think her question is has to do with the parking spaces that right. she doesn't want encumbered. So they must have been some. In, I don't know if there. I think there might have been one or two, but I can't remember exactly. Okay. Councilor Denton. Thank you, Honor. Uh, comment then. Two questions. Um, the comment is my strong preference would be to widen the sidewalks so we don't have to have this argument. Future councils don't have to have the argument about eliminating parking spaces, and that would be done through the master plan. So for those watching, when does that process start? So uh, there's two things. I think there is the uh, Market Square uh, plan improvements that that we do have that plan funded. There's some additional funding we're seeking for that in this year's CIP for public involvement. And then we also in the CIP have some capital funding programmed out in some of the out years for Market Square improvements. And so that is one part of that. It certainly doesn't cover the entire downtown. Um, I think that there could be um, further discussions as part of the master plan, but as an immediate area, that has already uh, been sort of programmed. There is funding available for those. We do anticipate the Market Square sort of planning process to begin um, actually in 2023. So I think that that's part of it, but not the whole part of it. I think the broader picture could be absolutely part of the master plan, which is also queued up for the CIP as well. So. And my second question, if I may, and the mayor was hitting on this, but I couldn't tell in reading, is the city staff recommendation to go with what um, uh, Pro Portsmouth would like on not allowing outdoor dining in those spaces until June 10th or so? Well, I felt the need to present that as a recommendation. I, um, I would say that um, I'm not, I, I wish I could had done a little more due diligence on that and could tell you how many businesses it affected. I would say that we would want to at least work with those businesses as a first uh, effort to ask them if they could remove during that period of time. But I would like to return to that as I'm not sure how many are affected. Okay. So I think Thank it's you. quite a few that it could be impactful. Mm -hmm. And it isn't until June, so that potentially holds them off a whole month. Correct. So. Um, uh, Assistant Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I Thank you. thought that was lovely. Um, I wonder if uh, the the group had discussed uh, a limited or standard size. Uh, I know they varied um, whether some, some had very large uh, plots, some had more narrow plots. Um, I know part of that is with the abutters, but I, I wonder if we could look into potentially having some type of standardized, whether you have an abutter or not. I know that was some concern with people that some seemed like a massive large scale, even with the butter approval, um, and some were more regulated to one or two parking spots. So I think that would be something to consider with even with a butter, you're, you're limited to a certain footprint. I want to say that we did see a few in the street that were very large. So I want to uh, just address that specifically. We did not, if there was not a parking space, we applied that $5 to the sidewalk and to the street. And that was, a uh, that, that was really, I think, challenging because I think those ended up being pretty affordable because $1,500 for a parking space, which is, you know, nine, it's probably, it's probably nine by 18, is a lot different than $10, a, you know, a square foot. So I want to say that those ended up being vastly more affordable than parking spaces. So when we did see a street, uh, that was utilized without the conversion of parking or loading zone, um, those did tend to be larger because they were more affordable. So the prices will adjust some of that, I think. Um, I think that will hit on some of those. But uh, I agree that there were some questions that some did span, and so we could potentially consider how large they could be. There were a couple, and we could take a look at the ones that were particularly lar large and wonder if the fees would help adjust some of those because they were affordable because they weren't parking space. And that was a tough one because we didn't really have a separate standard. If you were converting a street, then we just charged the same as a sidewalk. We didn't have anything else to charge. There's no parking space there. But that doesn't seem entirely reasonable because those were, those were really challenging in terms of traffic. And we still had to put Jersey barriers down for those. So there's some staff commitment and time. And then enforcement on the barriers of those were sometimes um, challenging as well. Um, thank you. Uh, my second question would be, I would like to request a report back from, from parking department. Um, as we know, there was, the fees did not recoup the total cost of mm -hmm. on street, but I would look to see if there was a decreased overall revenue or if those, that was 
those revenues were shifted, say, and we saw an increase in foundry or we saw an increase mm -hmm. of um, people parking in other paid spots. That's, I can make note of that and get him get back to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I also would just like to make a note. I completely agree uh, with the mandated handicap access. Mm -hmm. We did see, a, I think, less this year than we did previous years of, of different heights, but I definitely think we need to make sure that we have, and that's um, enforced and throughout. I love the idea of more uniformed appearance. Mm -hmm. um, as we know, they ca the costs vary from, from location to location, and some, um, some restaurants have the ability to, to spend more. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also like to see maybe the idea of expanding this program to some degree where if a retailer would like to say just take for a weekend in a budding space mm -hmm. next to um, a, a restaurant or cafe, they could also do that at some type of prorated fee. Um, try to even out some type of accessibility there. I think that would be really nice. Um, my, my last note would be I agree with the timeline. I think that we saw a dramatic decrease to use um, and to some people requesting barriers pulled earlier. Um, I think that would be great. And I think that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you. This is the mayor. All right, we're going over this way. All right, we'll go down the line. Council Lombardi, Council Boyle, uh, Council Cook. You first? Yep. Okay, yeah, just um, <coughs> one of the comments that I heard mostly from people is the closure of streets or the turning of one way or two way streets to one way. Um, what, what is the plan for that at this point? It's our recommendation that if traffic has to be redirected or circulation has to be um, converted from two way to one way, that those applications not be considered um, going forward. I recognize that will have an impact. I think staff fully understands the impact that that will have on businesses. We had hoped and we had kind of put them, as we entered into the season, letting them know that this could be more restrictive coming forward. I think that I, in my report, had two. I'm wondering if there was three, but there was absolutely two. So I think it would affect at least two businesses that were, um, that were only allowed to do it because we redirected traffic. But there is a lot of challenges with that and there's some safety concerns as well. And then a, a follow-up is um, during, um, during any given day, uh, restaurants may or may not be open during the day um, and some are open in the evening and not and those spaces are continue to be encumbered uh, when they're not open. Um, is there any way to resolve that? I think there is a potential way, depending on what, if we were to adopt like a standardized barrier for sidewalks to retract them during the day. Mm -hmm. The problem with the street, uh, with the parking spaces is that we have the barrier, the Jersey mm -hmm. barriers, and those are, I mean, a little bit trickier to move, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I don't know if there's something out there that would be more portable or removable. I have, I think we've saw one example of that, but generally there's that safety issue about the, the you know, oncoming traffic. Right. So I think potentially for sidewalks, so the short answer is potentially for sidewalks, a little more complicated for on-street parking spaces. Thank you. Councilor Bullock. Thank you, Your Honor. And thank you, Beverly, for this work. Um, um, and when we mention um, applications that result in significant impact of traffic patterns, I understand the two cases where we had to change the direction of traffic. Um, about on Congress Street, where there was just one lane of traffic eliminated. Is that recommended by staff still, or is that not recommended? I think that I think that our goal on those is to anything that changes the circulation pattern or loses a lane probably would not be recommended. Um, conversion of parking spaces, continuing to do that, and conversion of loading areas where we can pick up a parking space on the other side, definitely continue to do that, but really not to offset the tr this this circulation pattern. Okay. Thank you. But that would be entirely up to council if they want to make a distinction there. Your Honor. Cook, and then. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for the past year of your work. And I wanted to highlight that um, one of my formative experiences as a new counselor was coming into strategic planning um, at the very beginning, sitting next to you. <laughs> and uh, it being just a wonderful experience sitting next to somebody who had such amazing work experience in planning and getting to hear your views early on. So thank you thank again. You. Um, 
I do have a question um, that's around parking um, and fees. I know we collected approximately 98000 but 51000 approximately was from parking yes. spaces. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Um, and the idea is that, well, that's 384000 approximately in revenue or potential revenue. Um, so I want to follow up on the assistant mayor's question. Um, I'm wondering if we can get a comparison not to 2021, because 2021 was a boom year. Mm -hmm. um, and people were traveling widely. We had a huge influx of tourism that year because people were traveling in the United States. And I don't think that that's a typical year. Um, I'm hoping that I can get a comparison to another year as far as parking goes, and also looking at um, again, that offset, whether or not the park parking was just offset, if we saw a significant reduction in parking revenues in the summer? Uh, yes, we'll get that information back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that question. And I have one other question on, um, on barriers. Uh, uh, looking at the recommendations, um, I, I'm pleased with the recommendations that we standardize mm -hmm. barriers. I think that that's it visually more appealing probably to residents, but I also think it's safer because everyone knows exactly what the barriers look like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not approaching something that looks different and you don't know what that is in, in a parking zone. Um, as far as the sidewalks go, um, I noticed um, the recommended option doesn't include a standardized necessarily sidewalk option. Um, what, did, what would city staff recommend specifically for so I believe option. Um, I believe option two does recommend that the, the Jersey barrier, the planters, and a standardized sidewalk, and that we would find or bring something back to the council that looks somewhat affordable and also nice, and that we would say this is what we recommend that folks buy or something like this. Um, so I think option two is probably the strongest option. It keeps the, our investment in the Jersey barriers, keeps those wonderful planters, which I think makes such a difference on those barriers, and I think that some of the comments did. And then it also introduces the idea of a standardized sidewalk barrier. Now that I do want to pair the council for the fact that some people have made investments in their sidewalk um, structures. We did see wide variation in those. Um, I'd say we had a lot of problems more on the street with folks trying to essentially you know, improve them, make them taller, add wood to them. And um, often it looked very nice, but we did not get that consistent um, uh, um, level, the consistent standard. So, I think that option two, which introduces both the Jersey barriers and the planters, and then also some kind of standardized sidewalk barrier that we could identify and recommend for the council to approve, um, might be uh, a way to go. And maybe in the first year that could offset, we could offset that with some of the fees or something. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilor Tabor, and then Councilor Bagley, first bite of the apple, and then Assistant Mayor. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Um, thank you very much, Beverly, for all your work. Thank you. All your good work. And, um, and as typified in this report, good data to make decisions with, thoughtful presentations. And uh, you've just been a, a great refreshing dose of competence for us. Um, I had some conversations with restaurant owners and um, <clears throat> I think there's not a lot of argument about shortening the season. I think there's uh, not a lot of argument about some increase in the fees. I think we're really smart to not try to recoup all the parking revenue. Um, restaurateurs are telling me that labor situation is getting a little better each month, but it's um, it's still a factor. Um, so I think. Um, Modest increases in fees is important because we're also charging more for less of a period of time. Um, the tricky one is the roadways, um, and that's why I asked for the the traffic counts. Um, I mean, to me, outdoor dining has been a success, a real success, and it's taken the downtown and created a a whole new experience in Portsmouth was a great experience to begin with, with the streetscapes and the history and all, everything that people come here to see and the restaurants and nightlife. But we added this extra dimension of an experience. So to me, we want to go as far towards an outdoor street experience as we can 
um, while still making things passable. And when I when you said the traffic counts on uh, Pleasant Street are up around 2,500 a day, and changing the street direction and narrowing to one lane, you know that that one gets it tough to support. Um, Fleet Street is, I thought, a quieter street, but it appears to be just as big a volume. And uh, much as I, um, my neighbor Jay McSherry may not like this because <laughs> it's his restaurant on Fleet Street, and he really likes the experience that the outdoor dining creates there. Um, it's hard to justify 2,000 cars a day choked down to one lane. It's unfortunate we have to limit the experience we're creating uh, because of cars, but that's the reality we face. Um, so uh, I think what I'm hearing is uh, a shorter season makes sense. Um, some increase in the fees is, is tolerable. Um, we've got some common sense thing to do about traffic circulation, and I think you've highlighted those. Um, and, uh, um, you know, even though we hear some criticism of this whole program, 64% uh, of those abutters think it's great. So, you know, yes, there are a minority that uh, feel that there's been some friction for them. But I think when we as a policy-making body look at the value it brings to the city and the experience it creates, uh, we want to go full speed ahead. Thank you. I, I do want to note that although I didn't include it in my report, the introduction of fees did not result in a measurable decrease in participation. I believe we had two less applications this year, which could be counted for that the two were withdrawn. And I know that one, in fact, was withdrawn because of the fees. Mm -hmm. If I can add to that, the, the one that withdrew because of the fees was the only restaurant, to my knowledge, that was not locally owned it was part or of the locally mm -hmm. um, managed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Councilor Bagley. First uh, thank you, Your Honor. And uh, thank you, Beverly and staff, for mm -hmm. this. And thank you, uh, Beverly, for your service to the city. Um, I'm going to uh, make a few comments. Um, I've gotten to learn a lot about parking, uh, being chair of the Parking Traffic and Safety Committee, and I spend a lot of time researching parking um, and what makes a city vibrant and, and why we actually get to charge for parking. And the reason we get to charge for parking is so many people want to be in downtown Portsmouth that we have to control the inventory somehow. So, you know, the reason we charge for parking is to get that turnover, to get that inventory, to, to make our downtown vibrant. It's not for financial reasons. The financial reasons are a Let's call it a very nice auxiliary benefit. Um, to some of the other counselors' questions, uh, if you have $384,280 worth of parking at $2 an hour, which is what most of these places are, that translates to uh, $162,140 at $1 an hour. Because the reality is, if we have a vibrant downtown, people are going to go there and they're going to find a place to park. If there's not a place on the street, they're going to park in the garage. So we immediately recover half of that money. So now we have a delta between the roughly 100000 that we recovered in fees and the 162000 uh, that we would have had. So I think what we're looking at is about a 33% reduction in revenue if you look at it holistically. Now it's very challenging uh, to Councillor Cook's point to go back too far because we now have things like stay and pay and of course because of the pandemic. So I don't think we can really get a a perfect like for like. So I think looking at it from this perspective maybe is the correct way. And then this the second point I would make is, you know, the reason we did outdoor dining and the reason outdoor dining happened was because it was to save the restaurants and to give people a place outside where they felt safe so they, they could eat out. Um, and then we, we kind of discovered that by and large, most people really enjoy that experience and they like it and would like to see it continue. So, so I hope as a council, we kind of pivot in how we look at this. Um, we're doing the outdoor dining because we want it. We want the vibrancy, um, as, as uh, Councillor Tabor said. So, you know, I, I don't know that we need to increase the fees. Uh, if we do increase the fees, I would not like to see us 
double them. Um, maybe we could make a, a small increase. Uh, that, that would be my preference. The other thing uh, with the traffic, I understand it's a, a challenging issue. You know, one thing we could consider is is grandfathering those two locations in until they choose not to do it, and then it goes away forever, kind of thing. Um, I'm less concerned with the left-hand turn lane. There's a lot of research that shows if you slow down traffic through the downtown, it, it's a better and safer experience for everybody that's not in a car. And um, you know, losing that left-hand turn lane, it kind of creates a, a pullover place for people to run inside and get pizza. Um, and then it creates uh, two you know, relatively vibrant outdoor places. And, and I like Councillor Denton's um, approach that, you know, at some point we should really bump out that sidewalk. It's, it's a little silly that in a pedestrian friendly city like Portsmouth, we've got three lanes of traffic right in our downtown and a sidewalk next to them that is so narrow that if somebody's coming the other way, you actually have to step into the street to pass them. And we should be prioritizing people over cars. That's, that's my opinion. Um, so what I think we should do, since we're not in a hurry like we were last year, um, is a counselor should bring forward a proposal that we more or less kind of agree to tonight make sense for the next meeting in January. And then we could you know, get some feedback from the, the public, what they like, what they don't like, and then we could vote on it. Um, but I, I wouldn't support doubling of the fees. I think we should go a little slower. I'd like to keep everybody um, outdoor. I understand that may not be feasible. And um, the, the last point I'll make is we had some great uh, aesthetic barriers, uh, Massimo's, the press room, mm -hmm. um, the, the pizza place, I can't think of the name of it, right? the Rosa, sorry. <laughs> um, but we also had some, like uh, on Congress Street, there was a large one that I, I received a number of complaints about that it, they didn't really put enough aesthetic effort into it. Mm -hmm. So if we did choose one of these three options, I'd, I'd want to ensure that the aesthetic appeal of like that location gets better, but I wouldn't want to do something where we're now telling the press room that they're out of compliance because I think that's a, a great um, presentation. So just kind of put a lot out there on the plate for people to consider. Councilor Bagley, any other? Eating from that plate. All right, Council Moreau, you first comments of the night. <laughs> or not of the night, but first bite of the apple. And back to the assistant mayor. Um, I'd like to thank Beverly. I've thoroughly enjoyed working with you over this last year. Thank you for everything you've done for planning board, for land use committee, and all the work we've done. So thank you. As far as outdoor dining goes, I completely support all the staff recommendations. I think we do need to double the fees. I think that there needs to be um, the tra the changing of the traffic. I I agree with their assessment that it's it's a huge problem. And until we can redesign our downtown and make the sidewalks wider, which I'm all in favor of, I just think that we need to do it a little bit more methodically. And I, I just think that their recommendations are taking us. We had a transition year. We need to step back towards normality so that we can get in that direction. So I support what the staff has recommended and would move that forward. Are you moving that forward at the moment? <laughs> no, okay. I'm just giving right. my two cents since okay. other people have that. Right. <laughs> Assistant Mayor. Thank you. Um, we talked about the two majors, um, as we know, Fleet Street and Pleasant. Uh, I think there's an outlier that we didn't really touch on besides the traffic count, which is Hill Street, uh, which is predominantly in a residential neighborhood with a residential support. So I would like for us to potentially consider, um, you know, if you're outside of the, the inline of the downtown, maybe some type of um, petition or major butter as we do a butter approvals for downtown. Um, for that area, as we as we looked at the traffic counts, you know they're they're not as dramatic, obviously, as downtown, um, and it's really I think also the Hill Street location cultivated a warmness to that area. We constantly hear um, from people the lack of use of foundry because they don't necessarily feel safe walking down that area at night. Um, that you know that area just doesn't doesn't um, feel as comfortable for some people. But I think with that establishment, what they've done outside, um, again, I think with a large amount of neighborhood support and, and a butter support, um, really is something that I would like to see repeated. So I would like to see potentially some type of um, 
mechanism to maybe um, look at trying to to have two different scopes from if you're downtown where you're turning a street to a one way or if you're in a residential with with heavy support. Um, I, I don't necessarily think those are one to one. Uh, so I would like to make sure that we're not putting them one to one. Um, as far as um, uh, to Councilor Monroe's just statement, I think that and to support Councilor Bagley's statement, I think we have to look at this as the new norm outdoor dining, more vibrancy downtown, more walkability. Um, you know, again, as we looked as we looked to the master plan, as we look to market square renovations, I think we really need to come um, together and we, we really need to start getting input from the businesses downtown and the residents downtown. Um, I understand at one point in time, I was a huge supporter of closing all of downtown. Myself and several other business owners hired an engineering firm. We put our money in. We looked at it. Through the growth and through the conversations I've had with other retailers downtown, other restaurants downtown, residents downtown, I'm not necessarily sure that a completely pedestrian market square is the way to go. But I do think that we can look at um, closer, and we need to look at in more in depth, some streets, whether that is um, pleasant from state to, to Congress. Um, so I'm really looking forward, um, shifted a little bit, really looking forward to diving in next year with uh, city staff and residents of what the future of Market Square looks like. I was at uh, the Trees and Greeneries Committee today. I know not the most highly watched <laughs> meeting, um, but there was a, a photo going around of um, in the 60s, the uh, Christmas tree was in the center of Market Square and cars went around it. Um, so I think there's a lot of innovation and a lot of, of pleasantries that we can bring back to, to Market Square in looking through our history. Thanks, Sister Mayor. Councilor Denton. Thank you, Your Honor. I was actually prepared to uh, make the initial motion and then make some amendments to it. And since we're just discussing, I just want to let the Council know two of the motions, amendments which I was going to propose. Um, one is what uh, Assistant Mayor uh, just hit upon how like regardless of what the council decides to do with changes to let's say um, Pleasant Street or Fleet Street to make sure that other places with outdoor dining will still be allowed to have it on the street so the thoughts to bring back the um, <coughs> fees for street licenses from last year so we can play with that um, so some places like the one on Hill Street can still have outdoor dining and the second one, and this is just food for thought. I figured I'd read the motion now and explain it, so I'm not going to be explaining it on my feet at the next meeting. But it would be to amend the $200 compost, composting discount to the discount from what restaurants would have paid last year for what they would pay for outdoor dining this year. Essentially what I mean by that, if a restaurant last year would have paid $4,000 and then this year they would pay $8,000, if they were going to compost this year, they would still pay the $4,000 from last year. Um, the $200 is great. Six restaurants did it. Uh, the primary reason why I um, pushed it last year, I'm pushing it harder this year, is food waste is the third largest source of greenhouse gases in the world. And I think doing something like this would actually encourage more restaurants to do it because they would save money by composting versus, hey, here's $200. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Denton. And those are not motions that you're putting. No, forth I'm not now. making them. There's no the sneak previews. <laughs> okay. I think I, I think it would be good if we had a motion on the January 9th meeting. Um, you know, this is uh, and and we can move those uh, forward. Then I do want the public to be able to um, to be well in advance and notified uh, of, of that. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I also have a suggestion that the council start doing some of this pre-planning for downtown ahead of the master planning process. And the reason I'm making this suggestion is I feel that, you know, if we're waiting for the master plan process and we're going to, of course, hire consultants and go through that process, we're, we're looking at down the road another three, four years before we start really talking about what we do to expand sidewalks. So I think it's important that we start having that conversation now 
um, because it's it's urgent. You know, every year we're going to be having this debate about do we allow uh, encumbrances in, in the street? Do we allow um, restaurants to take up parking spots? What do we do with the sidewalks? When we could be having the bigger conversation, which I think this council is willing to entertain from what I'm hearing tonight, around what does our downtown look like with expanded sidewalks? I think that's a good point. I think, uh, you know, we could probably all agree if we kept the same amount of parking we had outdoor dining and the cars went slower, most people would be a fan of, of that. You know, getting, using, you know, thinking of our downtown as, you know, uh, Route 1, getting people as fast uh, as they can through the downtown is probably not the, the goal that, uh, that, that we had. Um, a couple of uh, just quick points, you know, uh, more tactical on the, if we do set on a, um, on a uh, design of some sort of barricade, um, if we could act as a liaison uh, from a purchasing power standpoint, make sure that we can organize bigger uh, purchases of these, having, um, you know, some of the smaller restaurants that, that might not have the economies of scale to be able to enjoy some of the economies of scale. Uh, that if we do decide on a you know, single approved vendor, um, I would agree on the traffic to the broad brush. Um, you know, the assistant mayor thought had a uh, reasonable uh, solution to figuring out, you know, where car traffic, I mean, if we just used car traffic, and I, I do think that all of the points that we're going to have are so that I think to a counselor, we agree that outdoor dining has been successful and we want it to continue. All of the points that we would make are an effort to, even if we disagree on some of those, uh, you know, how we go forward is so that it continues um, and people don't push back on it because they are incredibly upset about trying to get to the parking garage um, or, you know, coming back uh, from, you know, on Pleasant Street and not seeing it used and just um, it, it blocked off. So I think everything we do has to take in mind that we want this to, to last long term and we can't hope that we the, the sidewalks widen themselves um, and I and I do think some you know even if it's not closing down um, you know in the same vein of looking at you know uh, traffic counts if we're looking at large modifications to the traffic pattern uh, more so than even just the the closing of a street so if like we're taking you know and closing a lane of traffic and moving it over and then causing a, a traffic, I would expect that to be included in, in the ones that the staff is not currently recommending to, to move forward. Um, on that, I, I would love to see if there's a way for us to help, you know, I'm thinking about the Franklin Oyster House, they're right next to a driveway um, around the corner. Like if there could be a public-private partnership on that, and the city could facilitate something like that where there's mm -hmm. next to a, um, next to a, uh, something that could be used and if there was a um, an agreement struck between those owners that we could work to help um, help facilitate that from the city standpoint I'd love to see public private partnerships you know when it's when it's not the the city on the public side but you know just maybe organizing you know uh, that from a, a, a licensing standpoint fees you know I think that the same way that Councillor Bagley says that we don't have fees uh, in, in parking, you know, so, so some people who haven't met, read as many traffic or parking books as Councillor Bagley uh, would think that the city is getting a big windfall with cash um, when it comes to parking. You know, it is a lot to do with, you know, regulation of that. I, I think the same could be said of fees when it comes to outdoor dining. We want to make sure that the restaurants are using that space and they got some skin in the game to, to maximize that space and to, to make it the best. If, and if you spend double the fees, you're going to put a lot more effort into making sure that that is a great product that you're putting out there and not an afterthought. So making sure that if, yeah, making sure that the fees strike the balance. Um, and again, uh, I started on this uh, this with you know cars going slower and I definitely think that we should um, move uh, I, I do believe it's in you know we could find a way to allow it to the current master plan in terms of a walkable downtown um, and use the conversation around Market Square and the effort that's mm -hmm. going to go into that as a way to kind of jumpstart that conversation so we're not waiting 
you know, for something to happen in, in three years. Um, you know, the plan doesn't really kick off in the public partner or the public sense until 2024, 2025. So I think that we could use that um, and knowing that the funds are there. Um, a public speaker had mentioned the downtown retail, two things on that. Um, I'd love to see us try to carry forward some of the data around the, the trolley, you know, um, and whether or not people could be using the trolley. Like if, if this is gonna be something on, on high demand days where we do have a trolley that's going through um, the downtown, uh, I know that's gonna cost money, um, but it might allow us to use less, you know, parking space downtown if it was a fun and inviting environment. And then seems like a decent enough time to propose that um, we, Think about retail more broadly. It's too late, obviously, for, for this year, uh, but as approached by a few small business owners that we're talking about some of the events that they've seen at like Portland or SOAs down you know, in Boston and really try to make a, um, a, a you know, just like we have a, a market square in the, in, the, in the summer, to do something around the retailers, even more so than a small business type Saturday or a free parking holiday to have some sort of event um, downtown. I think the one in, in Portland, you know, they figured out how to, uh, you know, Maine has probably a lot laxer uh, liquor laws than us, but to, to have, you know, uh, serving um, beer and wine and some, being beer and wine in some of the retailers, uh, to have some sort of event that um, would be a, a pre-Christmas thing, I would think that would be a great way to show how serious this council is around uh, the retailers and supporting the retailers. So that was a lot. Um, and I appreciate, uh, Beverly, all of the work that you've done, um, and, um, you know, you will be, uh, you will be missed by, uh, by many that, that know, uh, what they're missing and even more, uh, that don't know, uh, what they're missing. You've kind of, uh, done a, a lot of work in a short amount of time that we very much appreciate. Uh, you've made the city of Portsmouth better and for that, uh, we're eternally grateful. Thank you. Thank, you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Sure. I, I'd like the opportunity to thank Beverly personally. When we hired you, we knew your talents and your expertise and your experience, but what we didn't know is how well you'd grow the staff. And I think each staff member is better for having worked with you and for you, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks. All right. Let's see. Pretty close. Does anybody need a bathroom break? No, we're almost done. Okay. Almost done. All right. <laughs> so, um, some appointments uh, to be considered under uh, my name: uh, the reappointment of Dana Levinson to the trustees of the trust funds, the reappointment of Phyllis Elger to the zoning board of adjustment, uh, the appointment of Alan Cohen to the task force to study public, private, private public historical archives uh, committee, and then I had um, uh, one more. Uh, for the task force uh, to study, uh, and I'd like you to consider, I believe this has been printed out and handed to you, so again, for consideration, uh, but Jeff Keefe um, uh, for the uh, task force to study private public historical archives. Those are just for considerations. Um, appointments to be uh, voted on uh, um, uh, this evening um, are, uh, and these are all to the, um, Arts and Nonprofits Committee Cultural Plan uh, Subcommittee, uh, that of uh, Alan Chance, Jeffrey Cooper, Ellen Feinberg, uh, Gerardo Gonzalez, uh, Tom Coffold, Amanda Kid Kessler, uh, Robin Lori Meyerkoff, John Meyer, Karen uh, Rosania, Emma Stratton, and as alternates, uh, Karen Battles, uh, Suzanne Danforth, and Ed Simeon. Um, we would need a, uh, a vote. Uh, Mayor, um, can you take Ellen out of this and vote it separately so I can recuse myself from that? If you would like to, um, can we strike? Um, I, mean, I don't see the conflict, but I will honor that. The um, uh, so I will ask uh, for uh, uh, I would await a motion to approve everyone uh, that I just read, but Ellen, um, and so moved. So moved. Wrong. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd wait a motion to appoint Ellen uh, Feinberg uh, to the Arts and Nonprofits Committee Cultural Plan. So moved. Second. Recuse. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. We have one recusal. Any no's? All right. Um, and I, um, I was <coughs> reminded um, that on a subcommittee uh, appointed, or the, by a uh, uh, mayor's blue ribbon committee, we can appoint, um, it doesn't have to be a, a city resident. And I've been really impressed with um, Anna and Sean. Um, and so I am hopeful uh, that uh, they will be able to continue to serve, uh, but this way an official capacity of uh, Sean McDonald and Anna Nuttall uh, to the Skateboard Park Blue Ribbon Committee. So thanks for their, their effort uh, and continued effort as they, uh, they get those lights. We, we, turn the, we flip the switch on those and, and work to see this a reality. Um, and then finally, I wanted just a quick update on the Holiday Lights Contest. Um, so this uh, run by the Citywide Neighborhood Committee, third year that since we brought it back after the pandemic, um, I'd like to, you know, I did put some pretty festive lights on my house, but I did not enter the contest um, for uh, reasons that, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, the, the conflict there. Um, there are 42 entries this year. Uh, there's a list on the city of Portsmouth, uh, forward slash city, forward slash holiday dash lights dot contest. If you just search holiday lights in the search bar, you'll get a Google map of that. Um, and the judges are school children. So, um, and their family. So if it's a school children, you know, too small or they just, you know, they're too focused as my daughters are on Frozen, you know, everybody will, will get a, a fair uh, shake. Um, they're going to, it's going to run through the 19th. Um, and there's going to be three, uh, three different categories as we had last year, traditional light display, uh, creative light display, uh, and then kids choice. Uh, and then we're going to announce the winners uh, on the 21st. Um, and look forward uh, to to seeing those lights. And again, thank you everybody for um, uh, for participating. We'll announce the prize and the winners. And and I will turn it over to the assistant mayor, who is festively dressed tonight. To hopefully, I, have I am. To do that. I mean, some may call this an ugly Christmas sweater. I would not. Well. Uh, I would just like to make the note is we have a resident on Ocean Road who has done spectacular displays for the last few decades, and this is the last year. So if, oh, if, so if the judges are listening. <laughs> I was going to say so if residents would like to drive by. Um, it is a spectacular display that involves 30 plus volunteers and dedication all year round. Um, so please make sure that you drive by and take it all in. Awesome. Well, thanks for bringing that. I think he's definitely going to get one of these. Uh, <laughs> but I think if you haven't seen it and it being the last year, it's definitely... Yeah. It's definitely a wonderful display. Well, uh, thanks for that, uh, call out. And with that, um, on to you, Assistant Mayor uh, oh, and second. Councilor Bagley. Bagley. Uh, Your Honor, Councilor Bagley um, and myself, as first time counselors, uh, have brought up the idea of a uh, Council year in review. At the beginning of our, of our term, we set some pretty lofty goals for ourselves um, and really outlined what we would like to do. And, we both thought it would be a great time to set a work session um, to hear from the public how they think we're doing to, and to reassess the goals that we set, uh, see if they need modifications, see if we have any different goals that we would like to bring forward for the second part of our term. Okay. And um, on that, would we, be, um, would we be discussing that like we did at the like at the offsite and then coming back and having a work session where we bring the public involved or is this all in one uh, conversation? I think Councillor Bagley. Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Opinion. So um, in discussion with staff, uh, January is quite full already. So the logical way probably would be to have a work session and then a retreat. Um, but with the schedule as it is, it may make sense for us to have a retreat and then the work session in February. So if we, we could do an offsite retreat, or right. maybe don't need a whole day, but for a couple hours, just to touch upon our goals, um, which goals we've achieved, which goals um, need some more work, and if we need to change course on any of them, now that we've you know, had a years of experience under our belt. And so then if there's a motion on the floor, it's to ask uh, or, or to uh, work to schedule a work session with the city manager to review the year and review something along those lines? Yes. That's correct. Okay. Um, I guess I would move to 
ask uh, the city manager to schedule a work session and a uh, council retreat in the month of February with the work session um, where it makes the most sense for her. Or I think I said that backwards. I'm sorry. I motion that the city manager look to schedule a retreat in January for the council and a work session uh, for the council in February. I would second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, uh, both Mr. Mayor and uh, Councillor Bagley. I look forward to that. And yeah, I mean, it's good to uh, it's good to check in on on that. And it was a yeah. Well, I think we'll learn a lot. Um, is that it? No. No, Ms. that's Lane not. Is. We have. Well, we have no <laughs> approval of grants or donations. There's no city manager informational items, uh, but we do have miscellaneous. Yes, we do. If you would all just bear with me. Um, last meeting, you all had a presentation by the uh, Valerie Rochon regarding Portsmouth, New Hampshire 400 and all the events that are going on. Uh, we were hoping to get the approval of the city council regarding the kickoff event. We have a few more details about it, of which I can certainly share with everyone. Um, the kickoff celebration, uh, we're planning for January 6th, which, as you know, is 1623. So that is 1623. So it's very, very cool that way. Um, it's planned from 4 to 6 p.m. with a gathering of the public forum air in the public forum area of Prescott Park, turning on the lights of the Memorial Bridge blue, the color of our logo, uh, walking on the sidewalks from Prescott Park to South Church for a short reveal presentation, followed by hot chocolate and cookies downstairs in the meeting room. Um, is there is an expectation there'll be less than 100 people? I'm thinking January, it's cold. I think there'll definitely be less than 100 people. Um, but there may be more at South Church because we may tell people, you know, they can join any part of it. Uh, we ha I have some details of sort of what we're planning on. The mayor was going to speak. We're going to turn the lights on. We will have volunteers to request that when everyone's walking from Prescott Park down to the church that it be on the sidewalk. Um, so about, yeah, we'll have the switch dropped off uh, probably around 3 o'clock, picked up at 4.30. Prescott Park would be like 4 to 4.30. Uh, and then uh, the walk along State Street to South Church would be like 4.30 to 4.45. And then South Church would be like 4.45 to 5.15, with the hot chocolate being like 5.15 to 6 o'clock. So um, if you guys have any requirements or, you know, okay, I don't know if we actually need a motion or what legally, maybe the city manager can help me here. Yeah, I'll chime in. Normally, an, an approval would come in in the form of a letter with less detail than Council Moreau shared. <laughs> <laughs> but in an attempt to get approval and have you all understand what was in, uh, what would be entailed, it would, if, if you were to vote approval tonight, we would hold a quick logistics meeting with all the relevant departments and support the event in, uh, and the steps taken. So I'd wait a motion to move uh, uh, or to send a, this request to the city manager with the authorization to act. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Any other miscellaneous? Um, oh, Councillor Bagley. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I, I just wanted to um, address the in incident at the high school um, and all our schools last week. Uh, as, as some people know, my daughter's a sophomore there, um, so it was you know hit close to home. Uh, there's uh, been a lot of discussion in the community about you know is there anything we can do better. Um, I do want to say, uh, as a parent, I was extremely impressed with the response of the schools and the first responders from the police department, both uh, our local department and the state police. I think, uh, you know, it's a stress test we didn't want, but we did a, a phenomenal job. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the community, is there something we can do better, uh, particularly regarding if we need more uh, SRO officers. I would say um, I've received a lot of feedback on that, and, and I would say it's about 50-50. There are, there are a number of parents that you know, think that's something that we should expand, and they have their you know, good reasons. And there, there's probably an equal number of parents that um, think that we could allocate our resources uh, in different ways and get more, um, you know, more, uh, more out of the, the resources if we allocated them in different ways. So I think we're going to continue to have the conversation in the community, but um, I just want to applaud the the response of the schools and the police department. I thought it was exemplary. 
Uh, thank you, Councilor Becker. I, uh, I would add to that on the, the topic, um, a uh, classmate of my daughter's uh, a parent, um, Gabe uh, uh, DeSaviaro, um, asked me to read a letter um, since he wasn't able to be here tonight. I'm not going to be able to uh, read that letter. I think it's a, it's a tough precedent to set when people ask me to read things. Um, I would expect to see uh, that letter in the packet, and we can acknowledge it at the January 9th um, meeting. Um, and the conversation will continue. I think for the folks at home, um, we control the bottom line budget of the school department. Um, if, if they deem that this is a good use of resources or they want to ask us for more resources, you know, instead of reallocating them. That's the conversation where we have. Um, I will say as a, um, uh, as a, as another parent, younger kid, um, I was incredibly impressed with the way that the, the police and the school department, and it's not just the cops getting there and they got there super fast. Um, but it's, you know, um, it's the shout out to Miss Kyle, my, my daughter's uh, kindergarten teacher, and I know that all the kindergarten teachers did an amazing job, um, but it's still in a, um, it's an incredibly uh, gut-wrenching experience when uh, the Saturday and Sunday after um, the hoax, your six-year-old is playing with her best friends, uh, you know, active shooter drills where they're closing the blinds in your house uh, while there's a bad guy outside. Um, and she didn't seem scared, and the school did a great job. And so as we're thanking the, 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 the police officers mm -hmm. and their response um, and the, the superintendent's uh, response, uh, timing response, um, so that we weren't worried, I also just I want to thank the, 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 the teachers that are in the classrooms uh, with the kids. Uh, they, um, they made the toughest day for Lori and I, um, you know, another day at the office uh, for my, my daughter, Tiernan. So thank you for that and, and all the work you do to, to create the future of Portsmouth. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, we've appreciated serving you for this first term, and I'd wait a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good night, Portsmouth.